My name is Kathleen Otto and I'm the Director of Business Development at BioNJ and it is my distinct pleasure to open today's live webinar with appreciation for all of you in attendance as well as those here in the room. In particular, we want to thank our sponsor, GE Healthcare Medical Diagnostics, all of our speakers, and our BioNJ Diagnostics and Personalized Medicine Advisory Committee. The BioNJ Diagnostics and Personalized Medicine Committee was created to advance personalized medicine through diagnostics by identifying and supporting partnerships with government, academia, industry, and investors in New Jersey. Today's topic is 2011 and beyond. What are the opportunities, barriers, and efforts in bridging the gap between diagnostics and therapeutics? This conversation dovetails very nicely with BioNJ's mission, which is to advance biotechnology and the biotechnology industry in New Jersey for the benefit of citizens, the economy, and patients here in New Jersey, the U.S., and the world. So we ask you to, when you have a moment, take a look at our website for additional information on upcoming events, and in particular, our bio-partnering conference, which takes place in Princeton, New Jersey, on May 23rd and 24th. Now I would like to uh, have the honor of introducing our moderator and the program chair of our webinar today, Dr. Samir Tari, who will guide us through today's topic. Dr. S Samir Tari is the founder and CEO of Picasso Diagnostics. Before Picasso, Dr. Tari was the medical director with Lux Biosciences for North America and India. Dr. Tari received his medical training in Cairo University, Egypt, followed by research, translational, and clinical fellowships at Columbia University and the New York Eye and Ear Infirmary in Retinal Diseases and Ocular Inflammatory Diseases, respectively. Dr. Tari is an inventor, entrepreneur, and was the leading inventor of polychromatic angiography and is taking the lead on developing it by starting and running Picasso Diagnos Diagnostics. He is a strong advocate for personalized medicine and he is founder, a founding member of the BioNJ Committee for Diagnostics and Personalized Medicine and an active member in the pharmaceutical and biological community in New Jersey. Dr. Tari also serves as an advisory board member for the Monmouth University School of Science. Thank you very much, Dr. Tari. Thank you, Kathy. It's a real pleasure for me to be here this afternoon and moderate this uh, seminar about personalized medicine. It's a very exciting time for those in the field of personalized medicine. A time of progress, challenges, and opportunities. With cost of healthcare on the rise, the expected increase in the demand for healthcare driven by the aging population, and compounded by the slowing down of the drug development engines in big pharmaceutical companies. Personalized medicine is thought to be the ray of hope that will transform probabilistic medicine to a safer, more precise, and affordable medicine. Joining us today, three first-class panelists representing three world-class companies discussing their realistic visions of the short-term future of personalized medicine, real everyday challenges that they are facing and actual efforts they are performing and implementing to overcome these challenges. Our first panelist is Steve Carcelli. Steve is the Chief uh, Marketing Officer of uh, GE Healthcare, where he is responsible for leading worldwide marketing for medical diagnostics, a $1.8 billion business focused on the development and commercialization of pharmaceutical diagnostic agents for oncology, neurology, and cardiology. Before GE, Steve served at senior executive positions with Endo Pharmaceuticals, Enzon Pharmaceuticals, Johnson & Johnson, Eli Lilly and Company, and Bristol Myers Quip. Steve received his BS uh, in marketing from Westchester University and an MBA in marketing from Drexel. Representing BioMaria is John Beeler. Uh, John is the director of Theranostics and business development at BioMaria. Uh, prior to BioMaria, John served uh, different capacities uh, for MDX Health. GlaxoSmithKline, Aronox Pharmaceuticals, and Wellstat uh, Therapeutics, in addition to the National Cancer Institute. He received his PhD in pharmacology from University of South Carolina and performed his undergrad, uh, undergraduate work at Villanova University. Uh, and last but not least, uh, Ron Mazumder, uh, the product development leader uh, at Janssen Pharmaceutical Companies of Johnson & Johnson. Ron obtained his BA from Johns Hopkins and a PhD from University of Maryland 
and an MBA from Lehigh University. After his postdoctoral fellowships at UCLA and the National Cancer Institute, he worked for Genprobe, Axis Pharmaceuticals, Motorola Life Sciences, uh, Merck, and now he is in Johnson & Johnson. At Johnson & Johnson, uh, Ron is uh, responsible for working uh, with the biomarker leads across therapeutic areas to select platforms and partners for companion diagnostic products to oversee and to oversee the development of these products. Today's webinar will include three short presentations uh, followed by a Q&A session. Without further ado, uh, we will kick off today's program with Steve's presentation. Steve. Great. Thank you, Samir. First, I'd like to begin by uh, thanking the committee, both Samir, my esteemed colleagues, uh, Ron and John, here as part of this uh, webinar. And especially, I want to thank uh, our folks and friends at uh, BioNJ for the opportunity to share with you some of our thoughts as it relates to what's happening in the space of uh, diagnostics and personalized medicine. Um, I'd like to start first by giving you a very short presentation uh, as it relates to our, you know, my view of what we think is happening in the, uh, in the space and how it is evolving. And I'll first like to start by giving you a quick overview of exactly how we look at the, uh, the world of diagnostics and personalized medicine. And I'd like to use cancer as, uh, as, as an opportunity to really highlight a couple of the key points that I wanted to emphasize. First, I think it's important to recognize there's what I would characterize as a bit of a paradigm shift as it relates to the treatment of care and cancer. And as we know, diagnostics is playing an important role in helping determine what is the appropriate treatment. But historically, what had happened in the past has been that pharmaceutical companies have created broad therapeutic products for broad audience. You were identified that you had some kind of tumor and you went in for some kind of treatment which was based on some kind of clinical guideline. However, there has been a big shift. And if you look at a lot of the treatments that have come out today, particularly in cancer and by virtue of what I've highlighted on the slide in the area of breast cancer, there are a number of companies that have created therapies that are targeted or more targeted approach common uh, to most of the folks probably on this call are products like Herceptin targeting HER2 new. But that is only part of the story. I mean, the big change happens to be that identifying the molecular profile of patients is really where the future is going. And the, the challenge of having the right therapy for the right patient is going to be critical to the success of patient treatment outcomes. And that's going to require a big involvement of therapeutics and diagnostics, and, and I'll share with you a little bit of how I see that. But that's shift number one. Taking a, a step further and looking a little bit about uh, shift number two, as I described, and it has to do with the pharmaceutical space. And I can tell you that there's a big shift taking place between what has historically been the small molecule approach to now uh, a greater focus on uh, a high price uh, biologic or large molecules. And, and you can see that by virtue of the, of the investment that the pharmaceuticals industry is using into those two spaces by virtue of what I highlighted on, on, this, uh, on this slide. You can also see that the pharmaceutical companies are focusing on either acquiring or developing this biologic space. And over the course of the past several years, there have been a number of big acquisitions demonstrating that. And that is, again, a step in the, in the right direction. What that's done, therefore, is really created this new model, where in the past it is broad audiences, broad therapeutics that have become billion-dollar, we'll call them franchises, into what I'll characterize as a more precise and higher efficiency as it relates to the type of therapies. The key to the success is really going to be how do both molecular diagnostics, both in vitro and in vivo, play a role in identifying the best patient population. Because targeted drugs um, will not be successful without powerful diagnostics, and that's a critical component. Now, a lot of this that I'm sharing with you is probably not, not new to most of the folks on this call. But what is new is the emphasis by way of both uh, other constituents that are really looking to this as a way to guide their business in the future. So pharmaceutical companies, payers, um, reimbursement organizations, um, uh, government or organizations are playing a more increasing role. And as a result of that, uh, driving the industry in this direction. So cost is a, big is a big driver of the business. So let me share with you just quickly um, an example. Again, as I, I was referencing earlier, breast cancer, and just do a quick comparison between um, both today and in the, what I'll see is a, a kind of a vision of the future. Uh, today, if we look at how treatment is done, people go through a screening, uh, both an in vitro and in vivo screening. There's a diagnostic workup. There's either a biopsy taken in the air of breast cancer, and that leads to quite a few folks with uh, a prognosis. But in the future, uh, there's going to be a little bit more of a precise view of that, and that will be 
in vitro diagnostics where patients will be able to get either biopsy through some technology, biopsy, and that will be measured based on some kind of genetic predisposition or profile, and as a result, therapy is going to be determined. So this combination of the therapy and the diagnostic is going to be an absolute critical, critical component. The combination of in vitro and in vivo will be the key to success, in, especially as it relates to saving money in the continuum of care. Uh, if you look at it very broadly, if, if you're able to save a significant amount of treatment outcomes um, by virtue of a specific therapy, it's going to make for big, big impact in patients' lives. The key to that success is really going to be focusing on two dimensions as I see it from a diagnostics perspective. And this is the combination of the in vivo and in vitro diagnostics. Uh, they both have to play a role in order to determine what's the best um, uh, therapeutic outcome. That is when, what I see as the uh, complete diagnostic so solution. The combination of the two um, between the two, the two to help find a disease and actually make an impact. Um, the two components will be critical to success. And while one has played a more prominent role historically in the past, in the future, um, they have to both play a role uh, in, in driving uh, patient outcomes. And that is a unique model. That has not been a historical trend. In the past, uh, you know, in vivo work was, was uh, normally done. In vitro played a minor role. But as I mentioned, with products like Receptin and numerous other agents in development, it's going to be a critical component of what the future has for us. So in looking at um, a quick, quick little summary, I think, uh, where do I see the, the, the business going? Where do I see uh, therapeutics and diagnostics playing a role? and why uh, molecular diagnostics uh, are important and what is the industry need. I can characterize them in the five key points that I have here. Again, this is the focus in oncology. One, there are broad tests available. There will be more in the future. The pathways are going to be well articulated and, and, and identified. Uh, second, there will be a broad pipeline of molecular diagnostic tests in various tumors in the area of breast cancer, lung cancer, and prostate. It's clear the, the wave of the, the future. That coupled with what I'll describe as a broad distribution channel, making sure that those tests are available on a broad basis to patients is going to be incredibly important. And with, uh, with the advent of a, a lot of localized testing, it's really, really important that we can, we can have the product broadly available. Finally, integration of that as part of the, the new molecular diagnostic test will be an incredible, important part. And pharma biomarker collaborations will be the key to success. Diagnostics will only be important as long as there are therapeutics out there, but I think that marriage uh, is continuing. So in summary, um, I think the move is towards, um, obviously, molecular diagnostics as part of the personalized me medicine equation. I've highlighted here just very quickly the, the, the key kit categories, both in vivo, molecular pathology, digital pathology, and molecular diagnostics all combined will make the biggest impact in driving. And personalized medicine will be driven by a diagnostic component more than ever, driven by cost, quality, care, and access. So that gives you a quick view of how we look at the uh, diagnostic business and how it's going to play a role in personalized medicine. So with that, I'll pass to my colleague. Oh, thank you, Steve. Uh, the move towards personalized medicine is inevitable, but the transition will not be easy. Uh, John will describe uh, an IVD global company's uh, perspective on the challenges facing the development and commercialization of uh, personalized medicine. Mm -hmm. Please. Thank you. And uh, no, very good presentation, Steve. And uh, just to expand on that point, I think what we're seeing is in this uh, personalized medicine is certainly coming, but what we're witnessing, I think, is more of an evolution rather than a revolution in the, the field. And I say that because if one looks back over the last 12 years, um, beginning with the approval of Herceptin, which is commonly referred to as the model for companion diagnostic development, we've seen approximately eight PMAs approved for assays for stratification or selection of patients for treatment with certain therapeutics. And out of those eight, five of them were for HER2 uh, levels, the other two being for C-KIT and one being for EGFR levels. So, and yet during this time, We've seen a number of drugs, targeted therapies, come to the market. And so, and yet, even though those have come to the market, we've seen a high number of failures. And so, the, 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 as Steve was mentioning, it's starting to set in that if you're going to use a targeted therapy, you need to tailor those treatments to the patients who are best going to benefit from them. And so, I think we're at a, a turning point because if you look at a number of uh, phase three studies that are currently ongoing with new uh, molecular entities in registration-based trials, 
Uh, there are approximately seven of them at least that are using a stratification uh, procedure for enrolling patients. We're seeing a very um, exciting turning point in the development of drugs and the incorporation of companion diagnostics into selecting patients who will best benefit from these therapies. I said there's over seven uh, trials ongoing in phase three, uh, looking at BRAF status, ALK status, MGMT methylation, C kit. And if you look on phase two uh, studies with new chemical entities, there's over 30 studies that are stratifying patients. So it's not a very exciting time, and yet going forward, though, there are a number of challenges, at least from an IVD development's perspective, that we need to address in order to be successful in this field. And I'd like to touch upon three of those, uh, including one from a logistics standpoint, one from a regulatory standpoint, and then one finally from a financial standpoint. So going to the first slide, um, just to talk about from a logistical considerations and challenges in, in developing companion diagnostics. It's well recognized that the fastest growing segment of the medical uh, molecular diagnostic market um, is the, the, the low volume, uh, high complexity testing. And if one looks at the traditional diagnostic industry, it has been tailored toward more of a high volume, low complexity batch mode testing. Which, which the samples are shipped to a, a central location and, um, and, and, and performed in a central laboratory. And yet in contrast, we have molecular diagnostics, which are, are complex assays uh, requiring special uh, in infrastructure, pre and post PCR rooms, as well as highly skilled trained technicians to run these assays. Also looking at a quick turnaround time. So in, in going to uh, applications for oncology, we see that it's important to know that 80% of the patients are treated in the community setting, and yet only 10% of the community hospitals are geared for molecular testing. And so we need to be able to, to service those patients where closer to where they're being treated rather than sending the samples out, and then also having a quick turnaround time so physicians can make decisions uh, for, tr for treatment um, paradigms. So, so that is, is one of the challenges. Um, second would be from a regulatory perspective. Um, there are, uh, you know, a very different uh, way of developing drugs versus developing uh, IVD products. Uh, we're looking at two different mechanisms. We're looking at a PMA approval versus an NDA approval. We're dealing with two different agencies, CEDAR and CBER versus CDRH and uh, the Office of Companion Diagnostics. And, and what we're trying to do is align the regulatory submissions of both these uh, products and coordinate their review and their approval at the same time so that the IVD is not holding up the, the, uh, the availability of the therapeutic. We also, when you start to look globally, uh, not just in the U.S., but then uh, Europe and, and elsewhere, you need to have uh, regulatory harmonization among the, uh, the different requirements so that we're checking the same boxes rather than doing the, having to do a lot more work and checking a lot of different boxes. And, uh, and also there are um, uncertainty on the rules and the evidentiary requirements that are, that are needed. Uh, from a regulatory perspective. There was a draft document that was put out back in 2005, and, and we're still waiting for the, the final uh, guidance document to be approved. And when that comes, I think it's going to give a lot of clarity into what is required in terms of the, the interaction of IVD companies with the agency, and uh, also in terms of what's required for analytical validation as well as clinical validation, the use of um, retrospective samples. And so as those come on board, I think it'll give a lot of clarity and a way forward for, for IVD companies. Uh, it's also important to the, the note that the industry needs to work closely with the FDA and the EMA, the regulatory authorities, through the various uh, uh, advocacy groups to drive this forward. And finally, uh, I would like just to mention from an economic consideration um, that there is a lack of true global IVD therapeutic success stories out there. A lot of the success stories we see are based on a, a laboratory developed test, such as Oncotype DX or BRCA testing. Yet when you look at an IVD, a true IVD, uh, you don't see very, very many success stories because of CPT coding uh, and stacking and so forth. Uh, and it affects the reimbursement. So for market success, you know, for an IVD company, um, as I said, this goes against the paradigm shift of, of how the diagnostic company has traditionally been, uh, looking at the high volume, low margin, uh, business and here in Theranostics we're looking at more of an orphan-like diagnostic status, yet without the orphan uh, value pricing. 
So, so we look at it from an IVD perspective. There's a, this MPV challenge. You have low pricing, you have low volume, and there's a high cost of development. And so that's a challenge for us as an IVD player to bring these, these uh, forward. And, and then finally, just the, there's highly regionalized criteria in terms of reimbursement, uh, whether in the US or in Europe, of what's required for reimbursement in order to get that uh, paid sufficiently uh, and, and to have a viable business model. Thank you, John. Uh, at the challenges facing integration of personalized medicine are complex and multifactorial. A multifaceted strategic approach is necessary for success. Ron will speak to Johnson & Johnson's strategies in this regard. Ron, please take it. Thank you, Samir. <clears throat> so we can go to the first slide. And I think a lot of people have seen uh, you know, all the press about uh, pharmaceutical industry looking for new models for drug development in the future. And I'll just highlight this uh, one schematic that was uh, shown by uh, Price Waterhouse Coopers in one of their white papers. Uh, clearly, one of the um, uh, central facets here is the use of, of both clinical uh, biomarkers and devices and diagnostics in the future of drug development, as pointed out by Price Waterhouse Coopers. Uh, indeed, Johnson & Johnson has uh, several guiding principles in their pharmaceutical development now and in the future. Uh, one of those is actually bringing integrated patient solutions uh, to, uh, to the healthcare, and this would be comprised of information, uh, medical devices and diagnostics, as well as the therapeutic and what we call beyond the pill, that, that paradigm. And um, a second guiding principle is really uh, creating innovative and differentiated treatments. For example, in cancer alone, there are several hundred uh, current drugs in development in clinical development. So we have, uh, I think Johnson & Johnson is very well positioned in order to execute on this strategy. Uh, we have the medical device and diagnostic sector, the consumer sector, as well as the pharmaceutical sector. We also have very specific ex examples of operating companies within J&J participating in this space. We have uh, Veridex, uh, which is a subsidiary of orthoclinical diagnostics with a, um, the, the only FDA-approved uh, platform for the enumeration of circulating tumor cells. Uh, and we also have Verco, which is a, uh, a lab which is looking at um, uh, the use of genotyping and phenotyping in HIV drug resistance. But beyond these capabilities, Johnson Johnson is also looking at expanding to partnerships where applicable in order to execute on the personalized medicine space. So I think we've seen several articles in the literature about what patient stratification really means and uh, the excitement behind uh, personalized medicine. I think uh, there has been some interesting papers from Stephen Paul a couple of years ago in Nature Reviews Drug Discovery where he actually showed uh, in uh, sensitivity analyses that the probability of technical success in phase two and phase three can significantly impact the capitalized cost of drug development, which is currently $1.8 billion. We've also seen in a very recent uh, perspective in Nature Review's drug discovery that if you look at phase two failures from 2008 to 2010, 51% uh, of those failures were attributed to efficacy. So clearly having the right targeted patient population in phase two and phase three can very um, dramatically impact productivity. I, I, having said that, I should also uh, point out that it's very difficult to, there are very few examples perhaps with the exception of what uh, John pointed out earlier, where you have a compelling genetic um, argument, either BRAF mutations or the uh, EML4 ALK um, fusions, that you actually have compelling genetic evidence for patient um, stratification. So it's, it is a challenge that has uh, a lot of impact, but also um, has to be executed universally. What Johnson & Johnson is actually interested in doing is understanding what are all the points of intervention along the entire healthcare value chain, all the way from diagnosis through compliance and monitoring. So uh, our uh, ideal companion diagnostic is not something, something that will s simply stratify patients into responders and non-responders, but in fact will be used for selection of patients, acceleration of market penetration, as well as in facilitating uh, choices between therapeutics, as was uh, referenced in uh, also another, another very recent Nature Reviews uh, drug discovery article. Uh, in fact, Price Waterhouse Coopers uh, has published another white paper about the issue of compliance and monitoring um, and how that is actually a significant issue across many different therapeutic areas. 
So if you look at the next slide, uh, this is a uh, Nature Reviews drug discovery article from the McKinsey Group a few years ago. Uh, they actually showed that multiple therapeutic areas will benefit. Uh, I've actually corrected this slide uh, just because we actually are looking at a large portfolio that also includes uh, neuroscience. So we have programs active now in personalized medicine in Alzheimer's disease, schizophrenia, uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, multiple myeloma, AML, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, as well as uh, cardiovascular metabolism. In order to execute on this strategy, we actually have a uh, cross-disciplinary group composed of many of the people you see on this slide, product development, uh, commercial functions, business development, regulatory, uh, as well as health, health economics. And that is really to be able to navigate a lot of the obstacles that John and Steve have already pointed out in terms of regulatory, uh, the regulatory environment, and, and also in terms of partnerships between pharmaceutical and diagnostics companies. So one of the big questions for us is that, not, aside from just the technical aspects, is really how do you drive adoption for the, for the, di for the diagnostic? Uh, there is an interesting article um, by Milo Lai Goldman in Genetics and Medicine a couple of years ago that's showing that the new test adoption typically takes about five years. So if you have five years, if you have a requirement of five years, that's really going to impact uh, sales of the therapeutic if your diagnostic uptake takes that long. So we're really looking at a lot of ways for increasing the value proposition to, to payers, both clinical and health economic utility, endorsement by the physician community, ubiquitous access, and promoting the diagnostic. So why is this important? A couple of reasons. There can be significant upside as shown in the first figure, the top figure here. Uh, the, red figure, the red panel shows the increase in sales if you actually can have a co-diagnostic that has been modeled financially with one of our um, uh, compounds. And the downside is shown by the, the lower box that um, an article from Diaceutics and Personalized Medicine showed, uh, con concluded that, um, in fact, the uh, Herceptin franchise uh, left perhaps about $3 billion on the table because of the fact that the companion diagnostic strategy perhaps was not executed as, as ideally as, as, as could have been. And in fact, even today, 20%, 20 percent of Herceptin uh, tests are, uh, are actually incorrect, as been shown by a, a recent article in, um, uh, in, in a journal. So uh, with that, I'll, uh, I'll stop, and I think we can start the panel discussion. Yeah, thank you, Ron. Thank you, gentlemen. So I'll uh, kick off the questions with, uh, with uh, the success stories that we had in cancer and infective diseases. Uh, are there other areas that uh, we can uh, give examples about of success stories or uh, new and uh, recently to come success stories? John? Uh, sure. Um, I think what you know, um, Ron touched upon is that you know, oncology has been at the forefront of, of using this, but you're starting to see it migrate out into other therapeutic areas. Uh, I, I'm not familiar with any success stories right now where it's been, been implicated, but um, as far as developing a companion diagnostic, mm -hmm. uh, but you're seeing a lot of interest in, in the rheumatoid arthritis, in the CNS, neurological conditions, and, and so as that starts to unfold, it's more being applied to um, uh, next-gen sequencing techniques to really understand the molecular profile of these diseases, uh, you'll start to see the uh, better adoption into those areas. What about uh, chronic multifactorial disease like diabetes mellitus, for example, uh, Ron? Yeah, that's, uh, that's an interesting one because uh, for type 2 diabetes, there are some genetic components there, uh, and it's very heterogeneous disease. Uh, we, we are looking at that, but it's actually um, a fairly uh, tough one there. We actually have many more programs now in the neuroscience area, oncology, uh, and also in the autoimmune area. What about non-genetic testing, Steve? Yeah, I think, I think um, if we were to fast forward, you know, 10 years from now, I think what you're going to find is virtually every chronic disease is going to have a component of what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. The challenge has been, are there appropriate biomarkers or measures that can be um, unveiled as a result of a diagnostic test, whether it's neuroscience, oncology, um, any therapeutic area? And, and that's, what, that's where the science really needs to kind of, quite frankly, accelerate. And I think by virtue of the, uh, the you know, the genome and, 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 and all the recent tests and successes in some areas like oncology, I think it's kind of demonstrated that, hey, there is, there is an opportunity for, uh, for success um, commercially. Because let's be honest, the, the big driver, obviously, uh, improving patient care is the num num number one most important element of it. But also coupled with the, uh, the financial benefit of it for, for industry, that's what's going to drive it. So 
I think that that's going to happen on, um, on its own. I think it's going to accelerate, and I think it may have taken us, you know, 20 years to get to the first, uh, you know, let's say HER2 new test in oncology, and I think the next 10 years you're going to see twice as many, if not more. Okay. Uh you touched upon the challenges, and uh, I would like you to start answering this question and then uh, shift to the other panelists. So in a perfect world, uh, what would you like to see from regulatory bodies to facilitate uh, the, the commercialization of uh, companion diagnostics and personalized medicine product? Yeah, well, to begin, I, I think, it's, as I alluded to before, is you start with uh, the guidance document. Uh, is how do we move forward? What are the requirements for analytical validation, clinical validation, uh, how do we interact with the agency. And so the, the guidance document uh, we hear is coming this year, so that's a good sign. Uh, but once we have that, you know, it gives some clarity of how we move forward. It's a very fluid environment right now. And, and as I said, there's a number of uh, tests that are in development, and to have that guidance is going to be very helpful for pushing other tests forward. Well, what's the G's perspective, Steve? Yeah, I, I, you know, I would characterize as that the FDA is building the plane as they're flying it. I mean, the reality is the guiding documents are coming out, and that's really going to help us better understand what their, the goalposts are. But I think it's, it's going to be an evolutionary process because not only will we understand what the FDA is looking at, but the science is accelerating to a point where I guarantee you the guidance they come up with today will be out of date a year from mm -hmm. today. And so it's about how do we make sure both industry and the regulatory authorities are, like, connected in such a way that we can bring these great therapies and diagnostics forward. And that's going to be the big challenge. And that's where things like advocacy and, uh, and, and the scientific community and associations like even BioNJ and, and the various groups are really going to help drive and shape that. Uh. Ron, sure. what's uh, Johnson Johnson's perspective? Sure. So, um, again, I think um, John alluded, said this very well, that the guidance documents, having clarity and f finality on that is important. But I'll, I'll perhaps add a little specificity to that as well. Uh, we do need to understand what really what bridging studies will look like, uh, the FDA's perspective on prospective and retrospective studies for actually um, validating the biomarker, uh, use of biomarker positive and negative populations, uh, how the intended use is going to be uh, dictating whether it's a PMA or a 510K de novo submission. Um, these are all things that we have to get better clarity on. Oh, thank you, gentlemen. So uh, last question for time's sake. Uh, Diagnostics have been considered uh, of secondary value as uh, indicated by, by uh, reimbursement. Uh, with uh, the advancement of personalized medicine, diagnostics uh, will be, become more important as they will uh, eliminate unwarranted treatment, side effects. And uh, is that, in your view, going to impact the balance in, in reimbursement between therapeutics and biodiagnostics? Well, I'll take a stab at that. We, we at GE um, absolutely believe that because um, the reality is the, the, the current level, economic level right now is unsustainable between high-cost therapeutics um, uh, with broad application that may not be utilized for, for all patients. And so I think it's inevitability that if, if the economics aren't such that it's going to be driven in that direction, that we will, the, the role of diagnosis will become uh, that much more critical. Now, I don't know if my, my pharma colleagues would agree with me there, but clearly it's going to be a, a kind of a happy marriage, quite frankly. In the past, diagnostics were, I would consider, kind of the stepchild of therapy. I think in the future it's going to be a, a, a full-fledged sibling, if you will, and that's going to be an important mm -hmm. component in making sure patients get great care. So what's yeah. uh, pharma uh, look? Uh, yeah, I think Steve said it very well. I think uh, really this is one of the challenges facing, uh, and it really uh, um, highlights partnership and collaboration between the pharma industry and diagnostic industry in the future. How do we actually take and change models for, for value allocation? How do we understand how to create win-win situations? And all of this under the mounting pressures of, of health care reduction costs. So I think there's no easy answers here, but I think it, it's going to involve a lot of these stakeholders coming to the table and participating um, and contributing. So we have uh, uh, room for one more question, and uh, I'll uh, take a question from the audience. So this is a question from Anne. Uh, given the financial picture you drew for companion diagnostics, what is the driving? What is driving Biomario to engage in that space? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's a good question, and uh, and so it's, it's part of the challenge going forward. But in doing that, what we look to do is is to establish a, a viable financial model with our pharma partners, in which we structure agreements so that pharma will pay for the development 
of the of the uh, diagnostic, as well as have success and milestone fees in there, as well as uh, you know explore creative reimbursement strategies. Uh, there are certainly examples out there where uh, Merck and Amgen reimbursed testing for um, KRAS and, and, and AstraZeneca reimbursed testing for EGFR. So we can explore those those opportunities, and uh, and we. I think that's the way forward in terms of creating a viable financial model. So, so maybe this brings me to some uh, uh, more difficult question. Uh, diagnostics companies are looking to make uh, uh, financial uh, benefit from diagnostic, personalized medicine. Pharmaceutical companies are also looking for that. Uh, on the other side, there are public and payer that are also looking for decrease in, in healthcare costs. How do you see a compromise being reached where everybody wins? This is uh, it's a great question. I think this is where you, you start to look at comparative effectiveness studies, clinical utility studies, and health economic studies, and you really have to show now the, the burden is going to be on all of the stakeholders to show the value of not only the drug, but the, the drug in that specific patient population along with the companion diagnostic. And I think the, the level of evidence that's going to be required um, in the future is probably higher than it is today. Steve, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think, you know, historically in the past, you know, the, the reimbursement organizations and the payers are, you know, kind of seen as the evil empire and, and, and the organizations that control costs and control uh, uh, um, treatment. And, and I think what's going to happen in the future, the, the components you mentioned, both the pharma companies, the diagnostic companies, and the payers will work together in some kind of collaborative effort to truly bring forward what, quite frankly, is in the best interest of all constituents, and that is the best patient care. Pharma companies do well when they have their therapy and, 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 and make impact in patient care. Um, payers do well when they can manage costs to improve patient care. Diagnostic companies do well when they offer a treatment that improves patient care. So we all have the same mission. The key is really coming together and bringing forward through health economics and other means to really bring that story forward and, and make sure that we do bring that forward. So what you're saying is that personalized medicine may save the day at the end of the day. Well, I mean, I'm a little bit biased, but uh, <laughs> I think, it, I think listen, uh, you know, um, it, it's, it's happening now. It's real. It's real. It's happening today, and there's no question it's going to accelerate. Um, the economics say that it's going to accelerate. The treatment and, and the research says it's going to accelerate, and um, I think it's about making sure that everybody works together to bring that forward. All right. So I'll... Uh uh, we came to the conclusion of this webinar. Uh, I would like to thank the audience and the panelists for joining us and uh, looking forward to see you in our next activity in September. Thank you.